Good morning. Good morning. Well, as we weather this weather, uh, we still come before a king this morning. Not a president, not a governor, not a mayor, a king. And he is king now and forever, and we praise his name. So we want to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning. As you're coming to worship with us, if you're visiting with us today, grab one of these welcome home cards right in front of you, fill it out and drop it in to the offering plate so we get to know you a little bit better. Announcements, we'll, we'll keep it really brief today. We have a lot coming up in September. Grab yourself one of the new links that's out there. Uh, but Rally Day is coming up on September 18th. This is an event where we're going to encourage the kids in the community to come and you know get involved in our Sunday school program, which actually starts the 19th. So we're looking for two different sets of volunteers. And you can volunteer for both, but we're looking for Rally Day volunteers who are willing to come for an hour or two or three or four and come and help us with that. And also our Sunday school program, uh, you know, you can sign up for a month or two months just to help out with the class or to teach a class wherever your comfort and skill level lies. They will teach you. They're very good at teaching you to teach the kids. But we have three different classes, so we want to make sure that all gets covered. So that's about it for today's announcements. Let's prepare our hearts and minds as we come to our Lord and Savior. Please rise. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so so kind to me Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99 I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You've been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You've been so, so kind to me. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99 I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no lie you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves 99 I could 
couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves in 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on.
now in our corporate confession of sin. Dear Lord, we are sorry for how distracted we become and for losing our way without realizing it. Forgive us and help us to know that you are the only one we need. Have a conversation with your maker right now and confess your sins to him. Hear now the assurance of pardon from Psalm 145. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Brothers and sisters, you are forgiven. Please have a seat. One announcement I didn't make at the top was that we're in, always looking for people to join us in our worship team. Uh, they, they do a great job every Sunday, but we're talking before the service. They would love if anybody has musical talent to join the band, or even if you would like to sing. They would especially love to get a female or two up there to, to lend their voices to the high parts. So if you're curious about doing that, talk with Gordon after the service or during the week. Join me now as we go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what an amazing contradiction it is to be in awe and in reverence toward you and yet being invited to come right to your feet and bring our requests and our day and our thoughts and our concerns and our confessions right to you. Lord, you invite us in with that familiarity of a father to a child. And what a wonderful blessing that is. That, Lord, you don't hold us at arm's length. You don't make yourself so unapproachable, so unknowable, that we can only take guesses. But, Lord, you have given us in your word exactly how we should pray to you, how we should talk to you. When your disciples asked to learn how to pray, you taught them the words of your prayer, the pattern of prayer, the content of it. And so, Lord, I just thank you today that we can speak to you as friends, as sons and daughters, as those you know, and knowing that you hear every word that we say and every word that we think and even the things that we're not thinking, that the Holy Spirit speaks on behalf of us. Lord, we thank you for the summer. I know that right now it's hot and we think about that a lot, but we thank you right now because in a couple months we'll be wishing it's like this all over again. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your sustaining will that gives life and breath to our being, that gives every day to us as a gift to use toward you, toward the works that you have prepared for us. I pray that we wouldn't shy away from them. Lord, so often you make it very clear to us what we should be doing for you. But we ask that you give us additionally that blessing of courage, and of strength to overcome our sinful nature that says, let somebody else do it. Let somebody else witness. Let somebody else love. Let somebody else be patient with that person. Lord, it starts with us. Please help us. Help us to step up and uh, do you proud. Lord, today we lift up to you several prayer requests. Right now, all those people down in Louisiana that they're facing yet another hurricane and memories of Katrina are still fresh in their minds. Lord, please protect them. Please protect their homes, their lives. Give them comfort and strength to help those who are the first responders on the scenes and the doctors and the nurses. Just everybody, put them into place, Lord, to help them weather this storm. We raise up to you the Gleason family as they're mourning the loss of their grandson, Hugh, this week. Lord, we're never prepared to lose those we love, especially those at a young age. And all the words in the world sometimes aren't enough, but we know your comfort and your peace and your presence is more than enough for them right now. So Lord, we ask that you give that to them. We ask for safety 
for the co-eds that are about ready to return to the different colleges and universities around here, especially the women. Lord, please protect them. We know that there are always predators on the prowl. There are always people who are willing to commit assault. Lord, shield them. Put into place those who are willing to be protectors on your behalf. Lord, finally, we ask for continued healing for several people in our congregation, especially for, for Deb. Thank you, Lord, that you got her through the surgery this past week, and we pray for continued healing there. For Margaret, for Linda, Lord, help them to continue on their road to recovery and bring them back to us soon. Lord, in all these things and so much more, we praise your name. We praise the fact that you hear us, that you care that our small concerns, the troubles of our heart, are not too small for you to notice and you to care about. And all God's people said, Amen. Please open your Bibles with me today. It's our final look at the Summer of Psalms as we look at Psalm 28. It's on page 541 in your pew Bible. Psalm 28, and please rise with me to show respect as we read God's holy word. Psalm 28. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help. As I lift up my hands toward your most holy place, do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but harbor malice in their hearts. Repay them for their deeds and for their evil work. Repay them for what their hands have done. Bring back on them what they deserve, because they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord and what his hands have done. He will tear them down and never build them up again. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry of mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. The Lord is the strength of his people, the fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. This is a word of the Lord proclaimed in your hearing. May you have the ears to hear it. Please have a seat. Let me ask you, it's a rhetorical question almost, but have you ever felt the sting of injustice? You know what I'm talking about? When somebody's accused you unfairly, somebody's leapt to a conclusion about you, Somebody who might believe something that's not true about you at all. The sting of injustice. It's, it's a horrible feeling. Especially when it comes with consequences. One person who knew that sting of injustice very well was a man named Robert Lee Stinson. And Stinson in 1985 was convicted for first degree murder and assault of a woman. He was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole. And there he stayed for the next 24 years until he was exonerated in 2009 by DNA evidence. I have to imagine for those 24 years that he sat in that jail cell, not a day went by where he didn't feel acutely the sting of injustice. Every day feeling like, I didn't do it. I know I didn't do it, but nobody believes me. Everybody thinks I'm guilty. And I'm serving the sentence for a crime somebody else committed. It took 24 years for justice to come to his case. Well, being unfairly judged as guilty by society or by the law is a possibility that all Christians have to face in our lives. Let's not forget that our Lord Jesus Christ faced the sting of injustice in his own life, encountered that almost every day in his earthly ministry. 
He was unfairly judged by the public, by his accusers, for being evil, being an alcoholic, being in league with devils, being a blasphemer, being a rebel, wanting to overthrow the company. He was convicted to die on a cross on circumstantial evidence that didn't hold up under any sort of scrutiny. He felt that sting of injustice. And likewise, those who follow Jesus are often lumped in with what the world sees as evil. And that, that burns us. We will be unfairly accused. We will be called things like haters, intolerant, vile, despicable. So how do we handle this? How do we handle it when we feel that sting of injustice so acutely that we want to fight back? We want to hurt somebody in return. I think we find great solace in the words of Psalm 28 here, which holds up a God who is a God of great justice, who tears down the wicked and upholds the righteous. Now, we don't know the specific situation that went behind Psalm 28. Sometimes we know the story of these psalms. This time we don't. I think we can get a general sense of it, though. We know that the psalmist has encountered some sort of gross injustice or ongoing accusation that's been thrown against him. And this has been going on for quite some time. This isn't something that happened the day before and he got really rankled about it and because Facebook didn't exist, he had to sit down and rant about it somewhere. This is a situation that's been going on for quite some time and to the point where he's beaten down. He's at his last gasp. He feels like if one more day happens that he has to feel this way, he might as well die. He feels like he's alone and there's just not much in the way of hope. So what does he do? Well, there's a few options at his disposal. He could try fixing it himself. You ever try that? Try fighting uh, by yourself against gossip? Against somebody, you know, a accusing you of something you can't prove on your own? Good luck with that. He could maybe wait for a while, see if those people accusing him might lay off, or maybe even come around to asking him their forgiveness. But none of that, obviously, is happening. The situation's getting worse and worse. So what do you do? What do you do if you're trying to get help, but the person you're asking for help doesn't have, isn't either helping you or doesn't have the authority to help you? What do you do? You ask for the manager, right? You're on the phone with somebody. You're not helping me. You're with a representative. They can't help you. They're being stubborn. You get to that point in the conversation like, ma'am, sir, give me your manager. Get me somebody who can help me. Get me somebody who has that authority. Somebody knows what they're talking about and not somebody who was hired off the college line a week ago and doesn't know what they're doing. Well, that's exactly what the psalmist is doing here in verse 1. He knows he can't get it done. He knows the world can't get it done. So he calls the world's manager. In verse 1, he says, To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear toward me. He's taking this terrible personal experience that's going on in his life. He said, Lord, take it. Take this call. Take this situation. I'm at my wit's end, and you're the only one who can handle it. However, even as he's doing this, he's very concerned that the Lord isn't hearing him. God has been silent already all throughout all this injustice that's happened in his life and the prayers that followed. So the psalmist has this moment of fear that God's silence will continue forever. Boy, does that sound familiar. In fact, in verse 2, when he says there, hear my cry, that is a mistranslation. What it should say is, hear my cries plural, because he has been praying day after day, prayer after prayer about this situation. And he has gotten zero in the way of response. And so he's hearing my cries. You ever feel like God hasn't heard or responded to the cries of your heart? Maybe the cries that you pray between sobs? 
You're going, God, hear me. God, do something about it. And you wait, and there's nothing but silence. It's disheartening. Then you know how this psalmist feels. Well, we know from the Bible, God promises us. He says you can do two things. One, you can always bring your requests to me in prayer, and I will hear them. And we also know in the Bible that sometimes God makes us wait for a response. We don't like it. But why does he do that? Why doesn't God answer us right away every single time? We pray, boom, prayer answered. Well, there's a lot of reasons. He's not doing it to be cruel. But often, God doesn't answer your prayer right away because he's building up your faith. Because he knows every day that goes by, that you continue to pray, your faith is strengthening like a muscle. You are working that out. You are anticipating that day where he will answer your prayer. And when that day happens, your rejoicing will be far more than if it happened on the day you prayed it originally. Let's not forget Jesus' own parable on persisting in prayer from Luke 18. You remember that? He tells that story of the widow. I always imagine her on a little cane. And she goes up and every day she's beaten on the door of the judge's house because she has experienced injustice. And she demands that that judge give her justice. But this is a lazy judge. This is a not, uh, not a great judge. It actually tells us he's an unjust judge. Nice little oxymoron there. And he goes, go away, woman. I don't want to hear your case. But every day she comes back and she bangs on that door. Give me justice. Go away. Give me justice. What happens in the parable? Finally, one day, it's like it's a game of chicken. Who's going to break first, right? And he breaks. The judge breaks. And he finally flings that door open. And he's like, fine. I'll give you the justice you want. Well, then Jesus brings us to the lesson of the parable because this is about prayer. And he says this. He says, will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? That's you. If you're saved, you're one of his chosen ones. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. It's God promising you. You will get justice in your life. But we are so impatient in our lives. We demand things right now. We want immediate results. Forget having oatmeal that takes 20 minutes to make. We need instant oatmeal. Kids today will never know the pain and suffering of watching a web page load for two minutes on a dial-up modem. They want instantly. They will never know how we ever managed to cook without microwaves. They will never know the agony of waiting until that one time, that specific time during the week where your favorite TV show came on the air. We want instant everything. That's our society. And so, as Christians, we often want instant gratification with prayer. And Jesus comes back to us and says, doesn't always work that way. In fact, it often doesn't work that way. God wants you to be persistent in prayer. Patience and persistence go hand in hand when it comes to prayer. You need to develop both. That's why patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. You want to learn more about that, go see Mary Owen. She did a VBS on that a couple weeks ago. So when God doesn't answer you right away, and you accuse him, God, why are you turning a deaf ear to me? Don't you see, if this is a situation you need to get on right away, realize he may have a very good reason for holding it out on you, for building up your faith, for teaching you persistence and patience until that moment where he does give you the justice that he promises. Well, if I ever wrote a book on parenting, I will one day. It's going to be a very weird one. And then we'll have a chapter called, So Now You're the Judge, Jury, and Executioner of Your Household. You see, every parent has to be ready at a moment's notice to suddenly arbitrate court cases in their household. That a great crime has been committed. Two kids get into a fight. Somebody's thrown a punch. A window has been broken. 
Food hasn't been eaten on the table. You hear that distant call of, it's not fair! And you have to go in as a parent and judge that situation. And it takes time. It takes time to sift through all the evidence, to interrogate the suspects that are often looking out for their own interests, pointing fingers. It takes time to judge rightly. And because of all of that, there's often a huge temptation as a parent to just immediately say, you know what? You're all on time out. You're all going to your room. You're all getting spanking. Whatever. Just lump everybody together. And if they protest, you say that same thing you heard from your mom and dad. Well, if you're not guilty now, you probably were for something you got away with last week. So, deal with it. The author of Psalm 28, look at verse 3. He's praying. He's like, God, don't be like that parent. Don't lump me in with these evil hypocrites. Don't drag me away to punishment. I'm asking you for justice, but I want careful justice. I want justice where you do learn, take the time to really go through the evidence and to see who is guilty and who is innocent. And the innocent people, Lord, me, please don't take me away with them. Well, it's here we need to pause and say a quick word about something we call imprecatory psalms. Because in verse 4 and 5, we get a bit of imprecatory psalm language. An imprecatory psalm is a psalm where the psalmist asks in very harsh language for God to come down and judge people. And sometimes it's so harsh that you as a Christian carefully put down the Bible and step away from it going, I can't pray this. If I pray this, I'll be sinning. And I pray, no Christian, this isn't loving. Why would you pray for these situa for God to smite people? Well, it seems very mean. Well, we'll what we have to understand is that the heart of the imprecatory psalm isn't somebody coming after somebody else with, with vengeance and meanness and hatred. Rather, it's the psalmist asking God for justice to be applied to an unjust situation. It's a psalmist saying, God, if it was up to me, this is what I would do, but I'm not the judge. You are. So Lord, come into this situation. Bring your justice. Bring your judgment. I'll stand by whatever call you make. Because you are the great judge of all things. The psalmist isn't rubbing his hands. He's not engaging in a shot of fraud going, oh, I can't wait until they're smitten. I can't wait until those bad guys go to hell. Rather, saying, God, this is unjust. Come down and bring your justice. That is the prayer that we should pray. Don't pray that somebody gets smitten. But always have an eye on God's justice. Even as we love our neighbor, even as we pray for our enemies, even as we go out of our way to do things in love for those who hate us, we need to have an eye on God to judge rightly. The wicked people mentioned here in Psalm 28, we might feel, well, it's unfair for them to be judged so harshly, for God to tear down their works right away. But realize they've had a lifetime to obey God, a lifetime to repent and to turn. And instead, they have chosen unending rebellion. That is what they've chosen. And as Matthew 16, 27 tells us, the Son of Man, Jesus, is going to come and he will repay each person according to what he has done. Romans 2 also tells us that God will render to each one according to their works. You can rest on your sinful works or you can rest on the works of God. Those are the two things you can rest on. One of them will get you off as innocent in the court of heaven. One of them will get you condemned. God cannot let evil win. And so Christians need to be, if we're aligning ourselves with God, we need to be aligning ourselves with His sense of justice and say, God, I don't want evil to win either. I don't want these bad things to continue happening in this world. You look at the news this past week, you see the bombings that happened in Afghanistan, you go, where is the justice? God, come down and bring your justice to those evil people that perpetrate such things. But we still need to have a heart as Christians. We call and we ask for God to do, handle the justice, but we handle the love. 
We go out, we reach, we evangelize, we do our part. But at the end of the day, we go, we're going to rest easy because God will bring justice to all things. Well, if Psalm 28 starts at the darkest time of day, if it starts at midnight, where all seems lost, all seems hopeless, where there, there's just no hope on the horizon, then by verse 6, we now arrive at dawn. The sun is coming up, and there are shouts of rejoicing. And why is that? Because as it reads, Praise be to the Lord, for He has heard my cry of mercy. The Lord, my strength, and my shield, my harsh trust in Him, and He helps me. We're not told whether God has resolved this unjust situation yet. But no matter what, the psalmist has come to a point where he comprehends that God understands and hears his cries for mercy. God heard me. God is working on it. It's going to be okay. And so he knows that God hears and God saves and God protects. And he can now rest easy and go beyond resting easy. He can start now praising God. Instead of asking, get, saying, God, please help me, now he can go, God, you are helping me. Praise you. And if God is now tearing down the works of unrepentant sinners, because those works have no place in God's eternal order, we also see God building up something, God building up his work, his work of redemption. The work that he's been working on for thousands upon thousands of years, culminating hopefully, prayerfully, in the salvation of you and the salvation of his elect. And we see that this project that God's been working on, the greatest project that humanity will ever witness, will result in this great body of the elect brought to him, glorified in front of him, and brought to their home, their permanent home, of peace and joy in His presence forever. I adore this final verse here, verse 9, where the psalmist, he basically prays for all the people. He's gone beyond praying for himself, and now he's issuing a prayer for the whole country. And he says this, he says, Lord, save your people. Bless your inheritance. Have you ever thought about that? You are God's inheritance. You are what God yearns to inherit as an, as an elect person. And then he says, Lord, be their shepherd and carry them forever. And once again, over and over again in the Psalms, we hear, we are taught the assurance of our eternal salvation. That we cannot lose it. We are carried forever. Not for a thousand years, not for a hundred years. Forever. It's what we Calvinists call the perseverance of the saints. God will see his good work all the way through to the end. And since that end is forever, he'll keep on working on that forever. And I love this parting image that the psalmist puts in your mind of God as a shepherd. As we, of course, know in Hebrews 13, 20 and other places in Scripture, it calls Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep. That's one of the ways that Jesus relates to you, a personal relationship with you, is he is a great shepherd, and you are, ah, you are his sheep. He loves you. He adores you, just as a shepherd does a sheep, as a shepherd tenderly caring for each one of his flock. This past week, a number of us went over to Sheridan Parkside to help them put on a carnival. And I asked, well, what can I do to help how can I take my many years of education and ministry experience and bring it to these people? And they said, go help with the petting zoo. <laughs> okay. So I go over there. I said, what can I do to help? And they said, well, can you carry a goat? And I said, yes, I have a master's degree in carrying goats. Let me have a goat. And so I, I picked up a goat, and I'm carrying a goat across the field. Think about, one, how strange this is, because you don't often go carrying goats. And also have, thinking, wow, I've been thinking all this week on Psalm 28 and meditating on this last verse of how a shepherd carries their sheep. And God literally put a goat in my arms and said, Here, this is what it's like. And I felt that goat, it wasn't fighting me. It was just very content. I kept whispering to it, please don't eat my sleeve. Please don't eat my sleeve. But that is this image 
that God is giving us in this last verse of Psalm 28. Of a shepherd where Jesus says, don't just follow me. He says, let me pick you up. Let me carry you. Let me take your burden off those little tiny hooves of yours. Let me carry you the rest of the way. Can you cast your mind all the way back to when you were a child and your mother or your father would pick you up? And you wouldn't have to do anything at that point. You'd just wrap your arms around their neck, put your head on their shoulders, and you would feel the sensation of somebody who loves you carrying you. That's what God will do for you from now forever. He wants to carry you. He loves you. Not Again, not holding you at arm's length. He is holding you as close to where I held a smelly, smelly goat the other day. And you are much more pleasing to him than that. That is what we will experience in the arms of God. The man of Psalm 28, he may have started in a place where he felt that sting of injustice. He wondered if that answer to that justice was ever even coming. Why it was taking so long. But in the end, all is well. In the end, he is being carried. In the end, he knows he will get justice. And we know that too. We know that even before we get to our answer of prayer, even before God answering our prayer and giving us justice, we can get a head start on praising him. And that's a weird thing to think about. We can start praising God for his answer to prayer before the answer comes because we have so much faith that he will answer us. That's what Psalm 28 is ultimately teaching us. That we know he'll bring us justice. We know he'll answer our prayer. Now how he answers your prayer is up to him. It will be a just thing and we can praise him for it. And we can start praising him for that right now, right today. So those burdens that are on your heart, the things that you are crying out for God, he will answer you. But we can start praising him for the God he is, the God who does hear, the God who does answer, the God who does bring perfectly good justice into your life. Let's do that with the rest of our service today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, carry us. Carry our burdens. Carry our struggles. Carry our relationships. Carry our aspirations and our dreams. Carry our worries about the future. Carry our memories of the past. Carry us, Lord, in your arms. Help us to feel you every day. Knowing that we don't walk alone. We don't have to do this alone. That you are a good God that hears everything because we are right by your ear as you carry us. Lord, we praise you for that in your name. Amen. As our ushers come forward for today's tithes and offerings, I remind you of Proverbs 21, 26 that says, The righteous person gives and does not hold back. Why don't they hold back? I want you to ponder that as we have our time of tithes and offerings.
God from whom all blessings flow. Blaze in all creatures here below. Praise Him all on the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we lift up to you our tithes and offerings given freely. May you use them to multiply the work of your church in this world. Amen. As our sign out front says, grace changes 
everything. Before you receive the benediction, if you would like additional prayer over you, know that we will have an elder up front who would love to pray with and over you today. Now receive our benediction from 1 Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God bless you. Go in peace today with your great shepherd carrying you.